He pioneered a revolution in brewing. Now he advocates a revolution in social attitudes towards race. Watch my interview with Professor Sir Jeff Palmer on The Alex Salmon Show, on air and online. Welcome to the Alex Salmon Show from stricken Aberdeenshire in Scotland, where our guest today is a very special academic. Everyone who's ever lifted a pint of beer has cause to be grateful to this man, and everyone with a regard for racial equality should listen carefully to what he's got to say. Sir Godfrey Henry Oliver Palmer, OBE, is a professor emeritus in the School of Life Sciences at Heriot Watt University and a human rights activist. He discovered the barley abrasion process while a researcher at the Brewing Research Foundation in the late 60s. In 1998, Palmer became the fourth person and the first European to be honoured with the American Society of Brewing Chemists Award of Distinction, considered the Nobel Prize of Brewing. In 1989, Jeff Palmer became the first black professor ever in Scotland and he was knighted in the 2014 honours. Today I've got the great pleasure of speaking to Jeff Palmer about his life and works. But first, over to Glasgow and Tasmina, for your tweets, emails and your messages. Thank you, Alex. We've had a fantastic response to last week's show on the Statue Wars, featuring Professor Sir Tom Devine and Professor John Robertson, with hundreds and hundreds of messages and record viewing figures of over three quarters of a million on Facebook alone. We hear first from Tom Gray, who says... Just hope the current school leavers are better equipped with a fulsome understanding of our history, as Sir Tom suggests they should be, than they were in the 1960s. Shona Dougal says, Very interesting points raised as to what to do or not to do with the statues and other monuments, which are causing offence to many. It is great listening to Tom Devine and Alex Salmond. Harry says, Why not a new plaque attached, stating the world has evolved, ethics have changed, slavery is unacceptable in 2020. TJ Schumann from Johannesburg says, Once again, humankind shows itself as the most destructive species on Earth, even destroying its own monuments. Marcel from Ontario says, This is so sad to see history destroyed, no matter what happened in the past. We live too much in the past. Edwin from London says, The Western European civilization has built its wealth and legacy on the strength of colonialism, imperialism, capitalism, mercantilism, which is mostly based on the exploitation and marginalisation of Africans. I'm learning since the death of Floyd that Western European civilization is not a meritorious one. Deborah from Durban says, No, maybe it wasn't meritorious, but it is what it is. Every event in history was progress from the previous event. Every generation has its own tale to tell and progress step to take. At the same time, looking back at history and remembering and making a further leap of progress. Every person who has and ever will live on this planet has a purpose in life, for good or bad. Tarya from Helsinki says, Don't need the statues of racists to get educated. History is what we need to learn. Gideon from Namibia says, I don't see any point on taking down slave master statues. I think the better option is to keep history and let the current generation change their hearts. Nancy says, This is all part of history. Destroying them won't change anything. It would be a great history lesson to others never to let these things happen again. Stuart says, it's nothing short of vandalism for whatever the reason. And finally, Brenda says, I think the statues should stay. They are a reminder of what has been. What will be next? Burning books? These statues and street names educate people. They're either ignored by people or they can enlighten folk. Let's not brush our history under the rug. Better in your face than not, I think. The Windrush Generation describes that group of people, largely from the Caribbean, who came to the, the UK between the late 40s and the early 1970s uh, as part of the large immigration that took place for people to take up jobs, often in the National Health Service or other industries which were suffering from a, a post-war labour shortage in Britain. Uh, the name Windrush comes from the 
the ship, the HMT Empire Windrush, which brought the, the first group of people from the Caribbean countries to the, the UK in 1948. As many of the Caribbean countries were at that time part of the British Commonwealth, the people who came across were automatically British subjects and entitled therefore to, to live and to work permanently in the UK if they so wished. Among those coming across in 1948 was Jeff Palmer's mother. And seven years later, at 14 years, 11 months old, Godfrey Palmer arrived in the UK to join his mum. And I'll take up that story with Professor Sir Jeff Palmer, who joins me from his home in Pennycook. Uh, Jeff, welcome to the Alex Salmon Show. Thank you very much for inviting me. Right, can we start this uh, at the beginning? Your mother came to, to London in the, the late 40s uh, as part of what's now known as the, the Windrush generation. W was your mum actually on the, the Empire Windrush ship or, or did she come in a, another boat from Jamaica? No, she wasn't on the Empire Windrush. She, she was on the Mauritania. And um, all the Cunard Line ships, I'm told, um, at that time that was transporting people, ended in IA. So I came on the Ascania. And that was some years later. You were, what, 14 when you arrived to join your mother? Yes, I um, came when I arrived at Liverpool in 1955. And, I, and when I got to London, I was 14 years and 11 months. And that one month has been very significant in my life because when I arrived, um, and my mother tried to take me to work the next morning after traveling 5,000 miles. I had no idea that I was coming to join her to work. And she was taking me to work and a, a, a man at the door stopped us and said to my mom, where are you going? And she said, we're going to work. Um, and the man said, you can go to work, but your son can't because he's only 14 years and 11 months and he has to go to school because you leave school in England at 15 in, in those days. So my mom begged and pleaded at the door that she needed him, you know, me to work, to get her money, to help her. And she spent 86 pounds to bring me here. And the man said, I don't make the rules. He's got to go to school for one month. And thus she had to take me to school. So that was a, a lucky intervention from uh, your point of view, given what happened later, Jeff. My mom took me to the local comprehensive school in London, North London, and they rejected me. They gave me a little note uh, saying I was e ESN. That means I was told later educationally subnormal. So she had to take me to the secondary modern school. I played cricket. The games master saw me, took me to a trial. And the next day he told me I was playing for London, schoolboys cricket team. And I played for London and the local grammar school headmaster, Highbury County, Mr. King, saw the report that a secondary modern schoolboy was playing for London. And he asked my mother and the school whether they would transfer me to Highbury County. So that's how I got into a grammar school, because of my cricket. And you were having your, your own educational struggles at the time and, and finding it quite difficult to uh, establish yourself through school and, uh, uh, and university. Tell us about, about the obstacles you encountered in that process. I arrived at Leicester University in 1961 to do an honours degree in botany. And 1964, I got an honours degree in botany. I went back to London. I, I went to the Labour Exchange. They gave me two jobs, one in a betting shop and the other one to peel potatoes. So I thought peeling potatoes was close enough to botany, so I took that. And I peeled potatoes from June 1964 until my famous interview um, in December 1964. Tell us about that interview, uh, Jeff, in, in 1964. Tell, tell us exactly what happened there. I was peeling potatoes, as I said, and I, 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 I was promoted to fish cook. So the, the, the company had great hopes of me staying, but I saw an advert for a, a research degree, in a master's degree, um, and I applied for it. And um, I went to the interview, it was at Reading University, and there was a panel, 
And I've not seen a panel like that because I recognize the man sitting just to the, I think, to the right. And um, he, as soon as I walked in and sat down, it started, and he just said to me, um, young man, why don't you go back to where you come from and grow bananas? And I was taken aback by this, and the professor um, to, to his right, who was heading the interview, looked and said um, something like, you know, come, come. And I just responded by saying, it's difficult to grow bananas in Haringey. And of course, I, I didn't get the job. Um, and But I saw another advert, and um, and that advert was for a PhD in Edinburgh um, at the Harriet Watt University. I did my research on barley. We changed the concept of how the grain grew, how the grain digested itself, and that laid the, the research or scientific foundation for my research later on in industry. The, the gentleman that suggested that you should be growing bananas, uh, this was a, a famous politician of the day, was it not? Yes, it was. It was Sir Keith Joseph. And the fact is that um, I've been saying this since 1964 when it happened and newspapers have carried it. Why that interview was so important to me and the statement, it wasn't because I was concerned about it being racial. No, I was not. What I was concerned about was that somebody was threatening my sense of belonging. I had developed that sense of belonging um, uh, when I arrived in Liverpool. I had to get to Paddington to meet my mom. I realized the sense of belonging was important in terms of me dealing with racism. And therefore, my sense of belonging was being challenged. And that's why I responded in that way. And since that time, I've taught students and I've given many community lectures. And I, I, I stress to young people that your sense of belonging is critical because that's what the racists go for. You developed the, the barley abrasion process. Uh, tell us a bit about what that is, uh, Jeff. I, I, I know it's important, but I'm not very certain what exactly it is. When I went to work at the Brewing Research Foundation in Surrey for the brewing industry, and the money was provided is primarily by the brewing industry, and I said, you know, if the brand did it, and any child can see it, the brand covers the whole grain. Therefore, if the brand is, is digesting the grain, we should stimulate the brand as quickly as possible. And that's exactly what we did. Of course, that uh, breakthrough... Uh, and the other uh, uh, parts of your, your research uh, probably knocked more pennies off more pints than any <laughs> Chancellor of the Exchequer in history and resulted in you uh, gaining uh, the distinction of the ASBC uh, uh, Award, uh, the, the Nobel laureates of the, of the brewing industry. Uh, what did these great... Uh, distinctions uh, in life. How did that uh, how did that relate for your in terms of your conversations with, with people when they, they, they realized the eminence of the professor emerging in uh, in Harriet Watt University? I, I just feel that my mom when she came up to Scotland to for me to get my uh, a Doctor of Science degree which is a, a rare research degree you have to submit all your publications. And she came up and when she went back to London, her, her friends was, asked her, you know, Miss Ivy, how is your son doing in Scotland? And she said, well, he's still at school. And she said, he's not really doing anything. He's just God's vehicle. So again, um, I see myself as that, but I'm so grateful to the Americans who gave me this ASBC award um, and that, when I got it, I was only the fourth person. And I was the only European who, 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 who took to have it at that time. So it was a, quite an accolade, and I appreciated it very much. Join us after the break, where we continue our discussion with Professor Sir Jeff Palmer, where we turn our eye into current controversies and get Jeff's opinion on what should be done. Join us then. Welcome back. 
Having conversation with Professor Sir Jeff Palmer, Professor Emeritus at Heriot Watt University and human rights activist. Jeff, on the current controversies of, of Black Lives Matter, I mean, you in uh, your years of campaigning will have seen a, a, a number of waves of, of protests searching for equality. In your estimation, is this latest surge following the uh, the deaths uh, in America of George Floyd? Is this is there something different about this latest wave of protest? Well, yes, I think it, there is something very different. The fact is that I call the death of George Floyd, I call it a crucifixion, and the the policeman, that's the law with its knee on the neck of a black person for almost nine minutes, showed the world there was something very, very wrong. And to me, it is not murder because nobody's been tried. But I see it as a crucifixion of a race which started with that definition, which said that black people are inferior to white people. And we've passed it on from generation to generation. And we cannot pass it on to another generation to pass it on again. Something must be done. And one of the consequences of the uh, resurgence of the, the Black Lives Matter movement has been the, the toppling of uh, statues of uh, people associated with racism all over the planet. But you yourself, as a, a long-term campaigner on these issues, have a slightly different attitude than many in terms of what should be done about such statues. Well, yes, I had a long-term view that the, our, our statues, like our, the stately homes which were built from slave money, like the Gallery of Modern Art, that's the slave master's house. You know, the necropolis is, was built by a slave owner. Um, you know, um, in, in Edinburgh, we have street names, you know, like um, the Fort Street and, and Rodney Street, all associated with slavery. Um, you know, half the new town, some of the buildings are from uh, a, a slavery. And therefore, I feel, I've always felt that we should be putting up plaques. We should have narrative on, narratives, narratives on these plaques to say, um, th you know, th this person or this uh, building and this street was named after X, Y and Z and they had this role in slavery. And it must be accurate. We don't, I don't want them down out of sight, out of mind. You remove the evidence, you remove the deed. They must stay with narratives on them where we can use them as part of our education um, in, in, in schools and in, in the community in general. And that's why I feel we've taken down two statues. The third statue should be racism. And we should not move beyond that. The third statue should be racism because it has damaged and killed enough people. Isn't this a huge opportunity through the education system, both to reintroduce uh, the areas of, uh, of Scottish uh, political thought that have been uh, neglected, like the radical tradition, and uh, to confront Scotland's own history as part of the imperial project and the beneficiaries of the, the vast wealth often built on slave servitude? Well, yes, I think the whole thing should be taught. You know, the servitude of, of miners and soldiers, um, you know, where they were treated so badly that they couldn't change their jobs without permission. And I think that should be taught. And, for example, why I believe that this teaching is so important. I was in Pennycook um, a, a few years ago. This is where I lived. I've lived here since 1977. And I was walking in the middle of Pennycook, and two little boys saw me. And one of them looked at me and pointed, and he said, there's an N-word man. And his brother slapped him on the head and said, it's rude to point. And therefore, that little boy was taught that you shouldn't point at an adult, you know, an oldish adult. But he was not taught to say, I should not be called that name. And therefore, we've got to teach children what that name is about, what it relates to. And they will have a better understanding that I'm not just an N-word man.
So your campaign for a new inscription on the Dundas statue has met with success. Uh, you are encouraged by the, the momentum that has grown in the movement uh, around the world. You've also been involved in advising Glasgow University about how to confront and make reparations for the fact that so many of its, uh, its benefactors had a, a role in the, the slave trade. Were you satisfied with how Glasgow University responded to the advice they were given? Absolutely. Um, I, you know, I was um, just a sort of an advisor, but the university did its own research. And again, this should be a model for all other institutions um, to follow. In fact, what they did was they looked at the history, looked at their records, and, and published a report um, to say, yes, we received about 200 million in legacies from slavery, the university did. And remember, that university has been around before Columbus went to the New World. And therefore, we have a university putting its hand out and said, yes, we were involved, and they produced a plaque, which I had the great honor of unveiling, and on that plaque it says, this university benefited from the suffering of enslaved people. I feel that Glasgow um, is, is, is like a first light, and I think that other institutions, some of them are now following uh, Glasgow, but to me, that shows what honesty can do. It, it, it produces respect. And your professorship, uh, when it came in 1989, I think, and you're still given the accolade as, uh, as Scotland's first black professor, but even now, only less than 1% of uh, professorships uh, around uh, the universities of the United Kingdom uh, uh, would identify themselves uh, as black. Isn't that an extraordinary comment on the, uh, which obviously emphasizes your own breakthroughs, but an extraordinary comment on the distance still to travel and a, a quality of opportunity? We don't have enough representation, and people's attitude are also based on representation. I'll tell two quick stories. Was one, I was in Edinburgh last year to give a lecture. And the, 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 the attendant at the door said, um, what do you want? And I said, I've come to give a lecture. And she said, at what time? And I said, oh, two o'clock. And she just looked at me and said, you can't be giving a lecture at two o'clock because that lecture has been given by Professor Sir Jeff Palmer. And the other one was when I went to another institution. <laughs> I went to another institution and the, the chap said, do you know anybody in there? Because I wanted some help with my phone to charge it. And he's, I said, yeah, I used to know the previous boss. And um, uh, uh, he said, um, the previous boss were your chauffeur. So we still have that, those perceptions of, of black people. Now the recognition and the, uh, the honors flowed. You became a, a knight of the realm, uh, an OBE, uh, and a freeman of Midlothian. Uh, I'm yeah. anxious to know, Jeff. Uh, does this freemanship of Midlovian does it in, uh, entitle you to to anything in addition to to a free bus pass? Do you get into buildings for nothing? Is there great, any great advantage in this freemanship? And are you in good company? Well, yes. I I was told I was in good company because the the previous um, uh, a freeman was was Nelson Mandela. So you know, um, uh, it's a great act to follow. If we look back at our history, Midlothian was the seat of Henry Dundas, the, the politician who, who gradually abolished the slave trade in, to, to the benefits of the slave owners, so they could replace their slaves when their slaves died at a young age. Um, and uh, this was his seat, and he must be turning in his grave to realize that one of the people who may have transported, you know, who he may have transported, is now the freeman of Midlothian, of which he was MP. And finally, Sir Jeff Palmer, people have got good reason to toast your health when they're drinking a pint of beer because of your achievements in brewing. But when you survey your life of campaigning, what else would you like people to remember when they're toasting your health with a, a pint of Guinness or perhaps some other more local, more Scottish concoction? <laughs> well, again, you know... Um, 
you know, the greatest um, sort of reward for me, and, and I, so I don't really need uh, um, any more than this because this, this is so wonderful. Whenever I go into a supermarket and I walk along the, the shelves and I see all the brands of beers or, or whiskey, and I, 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 I know which one of my students, uh, you know, um, uh, is involved with, with, with every brand that I see there because I taught them. And therefore that's reward enough because I walk along those shelves and I smile um, because I feel I've made some contribution, not only to their lives, but also to, to an industry that um, has been very good to me. And will it be important for Scotland to understand that this was a, an achievement of Scotland's first black professor? Well, yes, in, in a sense, yeah. The, the, the fact is that, I, I, you know, I'm, when I'm walking about, I don't see myself as a Scotland black professor, but um, that is a truth. And, you know, I, for example, when I came to Scotland, the, the university was um, threatened with the closure of the brewing um, department, you know, um, in, in the 80s. And I, I panicked because I just, um, I wouldn't get, I, wouldn't, I didn't think where I'd get another job. And I went to the distilling industry and a wonderful man there, Mr. Ronnie Martin, listened to my story one lunchtime. I said, Ronnie, they're, I think they're gonna close the brewing. And he said, what? This is Scotland, we need that brewing school. It's always been here. And he said, leave it to me. And to cut a long story short, he came back to me a few weeks after that, and he said, Jeffrey, I got you a million pounds from the distilling industry. And the brewers came in with 400,000, and that built the International Center for Brewing and Distilling, the International Center for Brewing and Distilling at the Harriet Watt University. It is there now, and it's got students from all over the world being taught brewing and distilling as a science. And that's why our students are so good at what they do, because they know what they're doing. Professor Sir Jeff Palmer, thank you so much for joining me on The Alex Salmon Show. Thank you, thank you, Alex. When Jeff Palmer became a professor in 1989, he was Scotland's first ever black professor. Now, even today, less than 1% of all the professors in all the universities of the UK identify as black. Jeff Palmer's career is a reminder of just how much the United Kingdom owes to the contribution of the Windrush generation and how shabbily they were treated in return. Jeff Palmer's views were once regarded as challenging and controversial. They still remind us of the leap of the imagination that we require to make to achieve genuine racial equality, but have stood the test of time and now have caught the mood of the moment. And so from Tasmina, myself and all at the show, it's goodbye for now. Stay safe and we'll see you again next week. <laughs>